Your Excellencies, uh, Professor Robert Merton, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the Singapore Management University for this first public lecture organized by the Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics for this year. I'm sure it's not going to be the last one. I hope so. Uh, we start on a high note, and I'm delighted to welcome our very distinguished speaker, a Nobel laureate, Professor Robert Merton, who will uh, speak to us today about meeting the global challenges of funding retirement. Every day I'm more and more interested in that topic. <laughs> um, let me first say a few words about the Simki Boon Institute for Financial Economics, or SKBI as we call it uh, internally. It was established five years ago to promote the study of financial economics and financial econometrics in areas of relevance to the Singapore's economy and the econo economies of this region. One area of its research focus is on retirement security, uh, silver security as we call it also inside, uh, insurance and pension systems. SKBI has been initiating, conducting and disseminating high quality research on the full spectrum of issues related to retirement security in aging populations here in Singapore. And we know that we are one of the record setters in terms of speed with which we age here, um, and other Asian countries under the leadership that of also Professor Benedict Koh. It also serves as a platform, SKBI I mean, uh, to exchange ideas and views on retirement security. To date, we have organized conferences focusing on retirement security, longevity risk, financial literacy, long-term care, market for financial advice, and retirement readiness, etc. The SKBI has also facilitated several industry roundtables and published industry-oriented papers in uh, internationally recognized peer-reviewed journals. Um, now, as I already sort of tongue-in-cheek alluded to, uh, Singapore has one of the world's lowest fertility rates at around 1.2 per thousand, and one of the longest life expectancies over age 80 at birth. Uh, this has made Singapore one of the fastest aging nations. And in the next few decades, Singapore will overtake most nations in the proportion of elderly in its population. Today, according to the statistics that were given to me, eight and a half economically active persons are supporting one elderly person. But by 2030, the number will drop significantly to only 3.5 persons per elderly person. This sharp demographic shift is one of Singapore's urgent and long-term concerns as it grapples with the challenge of providing retirement security for its citizens. Rising life expectancies imply the need to accumulate more savings for retirement. And research by our faculty members, Benedict Coe and Olivia Mitchell from SKBI, show that most Singaporeans use their money for their housing purchase and keep the remaining of their savings in the Central Provident Fund or CPF investment pool. And as we all know, but maybe for those among you who are less um, uh, uh, acquainted with it, the CPF is a comprehensive social security savings plan for all Singaporeans and uh, permanent residents. This has diverted much of the savings away, this investment in, in real estate has diverted much of the savings away from retirement. The bulk of non-housing savings sits in bank accounts, paying a very low return. That very low was my interpretation, but uh, that's not what is written here. But. A small fraction of Singaporeans choose to invest in financial products made available under the CPF investment scheme. And working Singaporeans who keep their money in the CPF fund receive a guaranteed 2.5% return on the ordinary account and 4% on the special account. While these guaranteed rates are of course attractive because they're guaranteed, it would still be a big challenge for Singaporeans and PRs to grow their savings significantly to finance their retirement. Now with substantial savings tied up in real estate, Singaporeans are increasingly experiencing an asset-rich, cash-poor phenomenon. High expenses and fees, as well as inertia, are the reasons why few Singaporeans invest outside the default government investment pool. And research is being undertaken here at our university and by our faculty to evaluate if the current investment menu offered is capable of helping Singaporeans build sufficient retirement nest eggs. Another critical area of research is to evaluate if alternative defaults, such as diversified investment grade bond portfolio and low cost life cycle funds may be useful in pension wealth creation in view of the inertia of some CPF account holders in making investment 
decisions. To alleviate the assets-rich, cash-poor syndrome faced by Singaporeans, it is timely to ask if restraints should be placed on the amount of retirement savings diverted into property purchases so that CPF participants have sufficient savings for their golden years. If so, questions like what should be the ceiling, ceiling sorry, so that Singaporeans can own their own home and still have sufficient savings for retirement. Other alternatives to generating cash flows for retirement include unlocking that home equity. And more research can be done to evaluate the viability of alternative modes and methods of unlocking home equity. While Singaporeans not only living longer, but also aging rapidly, the issue of longevity risk has become an urgent concern in Singapore. And a key challenge here is to develop long-lived financial instruments that can help retirees hedge and manage longevity rich risk. Although Singapore has mandated the annuitization of the minimum sum savings by requiring all reaching 55 years of age to purchase a life annuity, the longevity risk faced by Singaporeans is not completely hedged, in, in my opinion. This is because the current scheme is not inflation protected and the payouts are contingent on prevailing interest rates. Research should be carried out on the feasibility of modifying the scheme to provide inflation protection as well as guaranteeing a minimum payout to ensure that retirees have sufficient financial resources for subsistence living. You see there are lots of interesting research issues and that's the reason why at the level of this university we have decided uh, with the leadership of uh, the Dean Bryce Hull of the School of Economics, but also Professor Jun Yu and uh, many other faculty members to actually focus on this whole issue of economics of aging as a major uh, multidisciplinary research project for the university. And I hope that in the coming months and years, we will be able to provide you a lot more information uh, about the results of that research, uh, because we really think that SMU, that this is a very important uh, uh, topic and a very important area of research uh, uh, relevant to our society here. So that's the reason why I'm actually very happy today that we have a leading uh, thinker uh, introducing some of the, the, his ideas about uh, uh, retirement funding. Um, and uh, as I said, or as I think, the lecture that we have today by Professor Merton is both pertinent but also timely and actually very helpful for us here at SMU in the sense of setting perhaps uh, or giving us some ideas where we can make a difference. Introducing Professor Merton is actually uh, a little bit non-necessary. Uh, most of us here in the room know who he is, but allow me to say a few things. Uh, I will keep it short because I will want to give you some time to, uh, to give the lecture. Uh, but he is the School of Management Distinguished Professor of Finance at the MIT Sloan School of Management and University Professor Emeritus at Harvard University. He was the George Fisher Baker Professor of Business Administration from 1988 to 1998 and the John and Natty MacArthur University Professor from 1998 and 2010 at Harvard Business School. Professor Merton served on the finance faculty of MIT's Sloan School of Management until 1988. He is currently resident scientist at Dimensional Fund Advisors and um, Gladys already referred to it that we are uh, very happy to collaborate with Dimensional today here on organizing this uh, lecture. Uh, he's currently a resident scientist at Dimensional Fund Advisors where he's the developer of Managed DC, an integrated retirement funding solution system with global application that addresses the deficiencies associated with traditional defined benefit and defined contribution pension plans. He served as an independent director on the boards of the Dimensional Funds from 2003 to 2009. As we all know, Professor Merton received the Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 1997 for a new method to determine the value of the derivatives. And I was happy to see the pin on your label uh, that, of, uh, the, that very nice and modest Nobel Prize pin uh, that uh, is there. He's the past president of the, and I thank you for that because it shows that you uh, make this an important lecture for you. He is the past president of the American Finance Association, a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. With life cycle investment, investing and retirement funding solutions as one of his research foci, Professor Merton is well positioned to share with us his findings and views generated by his research. I'm sure 
The sharing by Professor Merton will provide us with valuable insights from which Singapore can draw and will draw in looking at its retirement funding issues. In closing, as I said already, I would like to thank Dimensional for supporting this event. And it's now my honor to invite Professor Merton to deliver his lecture. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. You know, after an introduction like that, if I were a truly rational man, capital R, capital M, I say thank you and sit down. <laughs> because, of course, the expectations created by such a, a kind introduction um, would be hard to, to actually live up to. That said, I'll try my hand at it. So the other thing I would thank for the introduction is I don't have to do an introduction to what I'm going to do. So I want to get to it immediately to get the most out of it. I don't need to motivate what I'm looking at. I will say a couple of things uh, to kind of qualify myself for what I'm about to say and for you to think in terms of interpretation. Because today I'm here wearing the hat of an academic, a researcher, which I've been full time for eh, about 45 years. Um, and at the same time, throughout my life, I've always been considerably involved in implementation. Things that I believe in, things that I think are really worth doing, I also think are worth actually bringing into the world. So I wear two hats in that regard. The only part of the second hat that I will make use of in my remarks today is that everything I show you, everything, is actually doable today. Doable on a commercial scale, doable in scale, doable at a, at a quite reasonable cost. I only say that because it was quite natural and often done, as we do as academics, is to look to the future, do the research, talk about what we would like to have, good ideas, but it's kind of like it's still in the lab, and maybe 10 years from now it will be for real, or 20. But what I, you know, I warrant to you, <laughs> that's part of what I'm saying to say, is this is all doable now, okay? I will not bring up anything I can think of you that, that isn't. The other is, I think my first paper on life cycle type of things uh, uh, was published in 1969. Uh, and so I've been working on this subject for a while. However, in terms of focusing on the specifics of what I'm going to talk to you about today, that work really uh, began in earnest, particularly with the idea of implementation, about a decade ago or so, motivated by events which caused me to believe that there would be worldwide major changes in the way in which we fund retirement. Uh, and so those are the only two things I want to say about the problem. That said, now let's get started. What I want to do for you today is we're looking at the challenge of funding retirement. We know that the you know, sort of tradition is there's a three-legged stool, that's the US version, or in Europe uh, or the UK, they use a higher, you know, the three pillars. I don't, I confess, even though I know a fair amount about the system here as an outsider, I don't know which you use here in Singapore. But the elements that are traditionally used to fund government, employer plans, and personal savings family. And through time and space, meaning in different places and at different times, different mixes of those three have been the way in which retirement is funded. Within the employer plans is where I've seen the major shifts, at least in the developed part of the world, over the last decade. So what I'm going to do for you today is to say, how would you go about thinking of coming up with what you might say is the next generation or a solution. This is a solution, okay, to how you might address this new challenge as a result of the change in the institutions. Now, I am, well, I have a PhD in economics. I'm an engineer by training and by mindset. So the way I'm going to present this to you is kind of the way an engineer goes to the problem. And so I'm going to first, before I get into, oh, you know, you have this and that and these investment strategies and so forth, the first thing you do when you attack a, ch a challenge or a problem is say, what are we trying to achieve? What are our goals? What is the goal of why we're doing what we're doing? 
Now, for this, the goal that I uh, propose this is, uh, is to provide for a good retirement. Does that seem like a, a reasonable thing? And by the way, if you want context for this particular solution, I had in my mind, and have in my mind, that this is designed for very large numbers of people, but you might say for working class, middle class people, the vast majority of people. I'm not concerned, not that this, and these tools could be used for it, upper middle class or wealthy people, particularly wealthy people, because they have advisors and other things that are not here. So you want to interpret what I show you as a proposed solution as being for that audience. So it has to have certain features that fit that. Okay, so when you're thinking about it. So what I'm going to do is first establish what is the goal. I think, let's say, a good retirement. Well, what's a good retirement? You know, if we're dealing with very large scale systems, we don't have individual financial advisors, all right? How do we know what would be a good retirement for people? Now, I'm looking at this audience, and despite the introduction that this is a fast aging society, you're a young group, okay? So, you know, I'm keeping this in mind. So I suspect for most of you, if I asked you what would be a good retirement for you, you probably couldn't really tell me other than to say, I want something that's good. And that makes sense. You're focused on developing your careers or leading uh, the uh, institutions. So most of the time when I get this, people are not telling me what they want. They're saying, what should I want? What should I need? If I had to make a guess for you, and most of you I've never met before, all right, I would guess that when you get retirement, while you would like to live better, who wouldn't, you're not going to want to live worse. You're not going to want to reduce your standard of living. By the time you retire, you've gotten used to how you live. The mysteries of whether I'm going to be up here or over here have been resolved largely. And you've gotten used to how you want to live. So for you and for the purpose of this lecture, I am taking a good retirement to mean as a goal, what we're trying to get for you, okay, is sufficient funding so you can sustain the standard of living that you enjoyed in the latter part of your work life, the one you got used to, whether it's here, here, or up there, okay? That's what I'm going to use as a goal. You can change your goal, but that's what I'm going to use. That's how I'm going to define a good retirement. Sustain it. Now, that's still not a financial goal that we can manage to. So, what does it take to define a standard of living? Happily, I think from some conversations I've already had here, I'm not going to have to work hard on you on this. But if I were to come here, you know, when I came here and visited, and I said, this is a rather nice place. Hmm. What if I were to come here to live? I mean, assuming I could get in, okay? <laughs> And then I say, well, that guy there, I see how he lives. I wouldn't mind living like that. I wouldn't ask him to embarrass him. So I'd say, can you tell me, if I wanted to live like he's living, what would I need? It's very unlikely that the answer you'd give me is $2,346,512 sing dollars. <laughs> what would you probably say to me? You have to be making about X thousand a year. My point is, standard of living defined in economic or financial terms is not defined by an accumulation of a number, a certain amount of money. It's defined by a stream of income that will support. Now, I see heads going this way. I say thank you, so I don't have to talk about Jane Austen and you know, her, her mother checking out eligible males like Mr. Darcy, where she would never would say he was worth 200,000 pounds. She'd say he's worth 10,000 a year. Again, a statement about a standard of living. And of course, most social security systems, most DB pension plans, don't say that when people retire, you have a million three or whatever, 
they say to you, your benefit in terms of income. I go through this because it seems to me almost unique in retirement. I say almost, unique is an absolute, but almost meaning I'm not sure if there's one I don't know about, okay? That only in defined contribution plans do you see targets or goals described in terms of an accumulation of an amount of money rather than an income. And I will show you today that if you have an income goal, substituting a wealth goal is not close. And that's going to be important because if you have the wrong goal or you measure the goal in the wrong units, it's almost sure you can't get to a good solution. It would be the ultimate, you might as well just throw darts. Okay? So we'll talk about that. So that what we will say is we will describe the goal of a good retirement as a stream of income for life, beginning in retirement, and is indicated in the opening mark, protected against inflation because it's a standard of living. These are our goals and our design. As you know, goals aren't always met. And we'll talk about that. But this is the goal. Everybody going to agree? OK. Remember you agreed later when you say, hmm, he took me down to a strange place. All right. Here, I'm not going through. This is a, just a hierarchy of development and defined contribution plans over the last 10 years. And I don't got to take any time on it. There's been something. Someone you mentioned life cycle funds. They're old hat over here, and I will show you why um, I th I'm trying to convince you they are close to being an adequate solution, okay? Um, but we'll let them get there. All right, now, I'm an engineer, so you agree on the goal. The goal is to get people to a good retirement, to sustain their standard of living, which will be described as a stream of income, actually a replacement ratio, to be very more technical about it, because obviously it's what you need to sustain yourself. The replacement ratio is nothing more than if you're making 100 when you're working and you're living on it, how much of that would you need to continue living that way in retirement? Clearly, in most cases, much less. Why? Because one of the things you're doing while you're working is saving for retirement. Once you're in retirement, you don't need to save anymore. There are other reasons why it may be less. So a typical replacement ratio might be 80%. So if you live in, you've been making 100 and living at a standard of living commensurate with that, then we estimate what you need may be a number like 80. So I will use actual numbers for the streams, and I'm not going to try to convert it to sing dollars, so I'm going to do it in U.S. dollars, but just it's dollars, okay? And what we're trying to do is get someone to that. So that's the goal. Now, in an engineering design, so you have the problem, now you know what you're trying to achieve, the next step is to write down the key, key design criteria. What does a proposed solution have to satisfy to even be a candidate? No way is someone comes and says, I have a solution. And I have a list here, which I'll talk through. If your proposed solution doesn't have these features, I'm going to say forget it. It isn't worth going to step two. So does everybody understand the design? So that's the next stage. Then after I've taken you through those and why I think they're important and critical, I'm going to talk about some of them in more detail to show you how different they are from what exists today. So what I'm showing you is not just a remake of what's out there. It's a very major changes. I also say that the things I'm going to show you are all order one effects. There are many more details embedded in here. You could drill down. Everything I show you, in my view anyway, is a first order effect. If it's not there, you'll notice it. It's important, OK? So let's start out. Well, how well can you see that up there? Is that, are you all right? Can you see it up there? All right, good. Uh, the first one is, I've already said, that we should be, the, the goal or the targets or the descriptions should be not wealth, not a distribution of wealth, but a distribution of income, inflation-protected income. So that is the first thing. Second, how do you think about risk? In this context, we say the risk that we're concerned with is how you manage it and managing it 
is the risk that the retirement income that you get is below the goal that you were trying to achieve, shortfall. So that's how we think of risk, how far below what you were trying to achieve it is. Third, and this one I'm going to spend a little bit of time on you. Any proposed design, these are all DC systems like your CPF, okay, or Australian you know, superannuation, for example, or the various DC employer plans in the United States. Okay, that's all of this is DC. Right? The third one says whatever solution you have must be work effectively, not just work, but work well for participant who never engages. And what I mean by never engages, they give you nothing. They give you no information. They don't tell you anything. They don't answer questions. They don't make any decisions. That's my definition of not engaged. And I press it more. It has to work well if the first time they get engaged is the day they retire. Basically, the entire accumulation period, you have no information, no contact with them at all. They make no decisions. They don't tell you anything. Now, you might say, that's pretty extreme. Yes, it is. But it reminds me, when I was in Australia, you know, I was, went into a dive shop. I was going to spend a weekend, you know, in the Great Barrier Reef. And I go in, and you see these big dive watch. I gave it to him. It's so heavy. I, if I wore it up here, I'd be standing like this. And if you look on the back of the watch, it said good to 100 meters, meaning waterproof. Will anyone put their hand up who has ever dived to 100 meters? If you did that in feet, 330 feet, that's a pretty deep way to go. All right, does anybody know anyone who did personally? One, good. That proves that, you know, that improves the answers. Why would a manufacturer, therefore, put on the watch, good to 100 meters, if no one's diving to 100 meters, or almost no one? Because, I think anyway, if you see it's good to 100 meters, it's surely going to be good for three. <laughs> if, as an engineer, you design the system to work well at the extreme, that they never engage till the day they retire, then if they engage at 62, or 63, or 54, or 47, it's a robust system. OK? And I won't go through. There's tons of documentation, scientific documentation, that people don't get engaged. They don't like personal finance. It has nothing to do with IQ. It has nothing even to do with education. I was a trustee of TIA Cref, a big insurance company in the United States, whose constituencies are professors, research scientists, teachers, highly educated and curious people. And I can tell you that most of them, when they joined, the first question they ask is, what's everybody else doing? <laughs> and when they made an asset allocation choice, they almost never changed it. And the documented stuff is that people don't get engaged, they don't do it. So if someone has a solution that says, Get engaged, you know, people have to get up every day and check out on their computer where they are and fill in forms, all right? That's not a solution. That's like we'll solve obesity in the United States by having everybody do two hours of calisthenics every morning. That's not going to happen either, okay? I under, underscore this because that's critical. Next goal, the goals should be customized for each individual. No on average. Every single individual has their own goal. It, it's a goal. They have the same type of goal, but their goal is the same. We do not say, for example, you don't want to have everybody who's 34 has this, is treated as if they're the same person in terms of the investments that are made. Just look at age. Remember, this is for core retirement for people. It's probably the second most important questions, uh, issues they have to address after their medical. Now I look at it, you. How would you feel about this for your medical? You go on your computer on the internet. You go to a site. You put in your age, but not your gender, and out comes your prescriptions. 
Would you be okay with you? Is that close enough? I don't think so. And I say the same as here. Just knowing your age, a 34-year-old male making 52,000 and a 34-year-old female making 150,000, 130,000, may be the same age. They have very little else in common in terms of how you should be managing the accounts and to what goals. So this vision is sometimes put out there. Well, it would be close enough if we just put in age. It's not close. On the issue of averages, I'm going to use uh, bigger numbers. If I were being politically correct, I'd use smaller ones, but I like to be able to divide in my head. Suppose you were talking about shoes. And suppose that some people wear a size 6 shoe and some people wear a size 12 shoe. How do you think it worked if we just had size 9, the average of the two? <laughs> just vision whichever one you are, how that works. Or I have my head in the refrigerator, my feet in the oven. My average temperature is not so bad. <laughs> Pretty painful. I'm, I'm trying to make light of it, but I'm trying to convey that I don't need to reject the hypothesis that age is insufficient. That's why, you know, it's like saying, can you prove to me the moon doesn't, isn't made out of green cheese? I mean, I suppose I could send a probe up there, but why would you ever believe that to be true in the first place? That's my point I'm trying to convey. Therefore, and there are other elements, we need to customize the goal. Now, it's at this point I remind you what I said in my introductory remarks. I warrant it to you, everything I show you can be done today on a commercial basis in scale at a good price. Because a lot of times people will say, yeah, it's a great idea, but you can't do it. The answer is you can. Okay? Now, next, integrate with all the other retirement assets. I'm going to put that off for a moment because I'm going to go in more detail on that. But that's a key element. It comes from the same idea that in portfolio theory, if you only optimize a subset of the assets, that optimization in no way can be assured to be remotely close to the right thing to do for the broader set. That's, that's finance 001, okay? And for that reason, you need to use at least the other retirement assets. Included in that so-called human capital is all the future contributions. Now, every planning model or whatever uses the future contributions some way, but they typically treat them as exogenous flows that come in every month. And that's okay for some purposes, but it's not okay for understanding risk. As you know, you need a balance sheet to understand. Flows don't tell you about risk any more than knowing the dividend one year on IBM tells you very much about risk. Okay? You need essentially the capitalized value. In other words, you have to treat it as an asset, not just as simply an exogenous flow. And I'll show you why that's important. Okay, so that it has to have that element. Now, I said it has to work with no engagement. So you have to figure out how you're going to get the information. After all, if we're going to customize, it must mean we have to find out about people. Well, I won't make it a mystery to you. The key elements you're going to need, at least I believe so, beyond age is and gen gender only basically because in most of the societies that have pension plans, at least at the moment, Women live longer than men. And the good news for you is that you do. The bad news for you is you need to have more because you've got to fund a longer time in retirement. Uh, but the really other important, most important, one of the most important along with the age is income. Because we're trying to attract a standard living. And depending on the, uh, you know, the society or the structure of the retirement system, uh, for example, if you have Social Security or a floor as many countries do, all right, you know, like the United States, that's capped. So if the cap is here and your standard of living is here, you know, here's zero, okay, that's a very different situation than with this cap, your standard of living is up here because you're getting much of your standard of living from that component of Social Security. Do you see what I'm saying? So clearly the income matters in terms of what you do with the portfolio, what you expect, and so forth and so on. Okay, how do we get those? Well, if this is an employer plan, we get it from the employer. Now, in different, by the way, I should tell you, this design was designed to work across geopolitical borders. It's not an Anglo-Saxon system or a US system, and, and it can be adapted. It can be adopted systems that have 
just about every kind of feature, including here, the CPF. Okay? But it was designed to work this way. So you change some, some dials and so forth, but the whole, the whole thing will, will work. So you have this, this uh, 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 component and in there, so you need this information, and we get it from the employer. It may come from payroll, it may come from uh, law requires them in, in some countries, for example, Australia has just mandated that they must have that information. In fact, all the information you need for this are automatically in their system. Other places you do it, but it's doable. And if you can't do it, for those of you who are academics among you, you know, you know, engineers never give up. They have to get a solution. So it's, what is not acceptable to say is there's no answer. So if they don't give you the income, you use the contribution. And if they're defaulters, remember we're dealing with people, we know the rules for the default. We can back out the income. The important thing is you see their income go up or down or not change when it changes. When you see the contribution changes in the default system, you know why it changed. They get a change in income. So broadly speaking, we have ways, there are ways to extract that information without ever talking to the individual or relying on the reliability of the information that the individual give you. Okay? So that's how we deal with that trust. But everything will work, but what if you could get people engaged? In fact, those of you may well know, in systems, DC systems that involve in, in choices by individuals, there's a, they always say the mantra is get them engaged. Well, I would modify that slightly and say, get them engaged, provided engagement improves their chance of getting to the goal. I might get people engaged to go home after work and go on their computers and trade futures. They may be very involved in it like a computer game. I doubt, and in fact, I know it won't help them get to a good retirement. So we want to get them engaged for good purposes. If you do that, then the rule says only provide them with meaningful information and meaningful choices. And meaningful is different from important. And I can illustrate the difference, I think, quickly. It's a little dangerous here in Singapore, given the price of getting an automobile. But if you don't have an automobile, you probably know somebody, unlike the diver, who has one. Ask that person or imagine what it's like to go shopping for an automobile, OK? And let's say you've just been to a dealer down the street to look at a car, and now you come to see me, and I'm the car dealer. And you come in, and you say, I've been looking at this car down the street. And I say, oh, yeah, that dealer, John, he's a good guy. But I've got to tell you, all of John's engines in his cars, all of them, have 9 to 1 compression ratios. All of my engines have 9.3 to 1 compression ratios. Now, you're smart enough to figure out that if I'm telling you this, a higher compression ratio must be good, right? Question for you. How much does a 3 tenths higher compression ratio from 9 to 9.3 improve the gas mileage of a car? How much faster will the car accelerate to a particular speed as a result of that? How much more reliable is the engine? Those are the meaningful things to you. Can anybody make that conversion? Your friend? Now, I was an auto engineer at one time, I, you know, and I actually used to build cars. And I can tell you one thing as an engineer, compression ratio is very important to the function of the engine. It's important. So there's no question that information is important. But I can't answer that off the top of my head. You have to do an awful lot to do that. So it's not meaningful. So it's an example of important information, but it's not meaningful. Now, how does that bear here? As someone who's been around this, the finance industry for decades, when I look at it, most of the advice, particularly that's given to individuals, we show them risk-return frontiers. We, ask, we give them questionnaires. Are you aggressive? Are you conservative? And I think those depend on the day of the week, whether the markets have been up, have had a good day, or, you know, first of all, but what does those things even mean in a, in a meaningful context, okay? What else do they do? They say, what asset allocation do you want, let alone which individual things you want to buy? What asset, how much Thai real estate do you want? Now, 
Asset allocation is incredibly important to the performance of investment portfolios, that's for sure. So we're not questioning that. But none of those is meaningful in terms of how that converts into your chances of getting to a better retirement. Am I breaking down? Oh, phew. okay, just water. Uh, do you see? So when I say meaningful, that's what I mean. And I submit to you, if you look at what are given to people, past historical returns to make decisions, professionals whose full-time job, they may work here at GIC, at Tomasic, they may work in the private sector as analysts or portfolio managers, test, or, or people who give their money to, the, to managers, testing whether it's luck or skill is very difficult for professionals. You seriously think, I don't care if that person has 180 IQ, this is nothing about being smart or having a great intelligence, that if you give them a bunch of those historical numbers, that they have a chance of, meaning, of making that judgment? I don't think so. So it doesn't qualify. And yet, a lot of times we're mandated to give that sort of thing. And the illusion is, well, if we give it all to them, we've disclosed. Or now they go ahead and do it. And I'm going to show you when we get engaged how compact this makes everything once you accept it. So this is what we do with engaged people. Last point, retirement is a two-act play. First act, which has been the emphasis in DC world for many years, is accumulation. And for a long time in places like the United States, they say, yeah, that's good enough. Why? Because relatively, the baby boomers are all accumulating. Nobody was retiring right relatively and from these plans, so nobody cared. But the second act is the whole reason you did the first, which is now you reach retirement, now you have to decide what you do with the money in terms of the drawdowns. And a well-designed system should have those be as seamless as possible and certainly integrated. It doesn't do you any good if you get them somewhere and then they, you have to go and try to figure out how to do it. So those are the designs. I spent a good bit of time on them because these are key. And if you're not familiar, you'll find that most of these are not <coughs> mainstream or at all in existing plans. Okay? So I'm trying to convey to you, these are incorporating these. is fairly big change, uh, but it's doable. Okay. Now... The way, you know, you have to have an objective function. We say we know what, you know, we're trying to get people a good goal. What's the objective function? You know, what do you optimize? And we chose in here, you can choose your other one. Now you're in a realm. We said the objective function is we have this goal to get you to that level of inflation protected income such that you can sustain your standard of living. And that's the focus on the goal. What we say is, however, we pick another income level, same unit, same idea, which we call conservative income level. It's not subsistence or anything else. It's just called the conservative. And that level of income has to be, it's not, nothing's guaranteed in a DC system. You may be aware, so nothing's guaranteed here. But the money is managed for this, the, the assets that are dedicated to this, and the money is managed so that the probability of achieving that is extremely high, within the model over 96%. And it's also you know, put in assets that, in a crisis, if you opened it up, those assets would be the kind of assets you want to find. Okay, so there's not a lot of correlation. You know, it, it's real, it, it, okay? Not guaranteed, but it's very safe. So we have two levels. We have the, where we're trying to get you, let's say, 80. And then we have the conservative level, which is lower, let's say, 50. Then what we say is, we maximize your chance of success of achieving the goal. That's our focus, a good retirement. Subject to, you have at least 50, the conservative. Or 60, I mean, wherever you set it. And you shouldn't think, you know, here's the goal, and then you set the conservative. You shouldn't think of conservative as subsistence and then upside. That's the wrong mindset at least for the design. The focus is getting you to a good retirement. This is the way we measure risk. We had to find a way to convey risk, otherwise if you don't convey risk, you act like the world's certain, that's not good. Do you see that if, it, if the conservator is very close to the goal, 
you're not taking much risk. And if it's very far from the goal, you're taking more risk. Believe it or not, in real world people, you know, focus groups around the world, not just in the US, they understand that. They do understand that's more risk or less. In a way they don't understand if you say, your standard deviation is gonna be 17.2 instead of 16.4. That they don't seem to relate to. And God forbid you show them a whole probability distribution, they just go right off the rails. So this is about being practical. Those who have studied behavioral finance, those that, all of this is embedded in this as a shorthand of the tools. So it sounds simple, but there's a lot that engaged in doing these things. So this is the, the idea. So we maximize the probability of success subject to that. Okay, everybody got the objective function? All right, now let's move with this. I've got here how this contrasts before we move on. Conventional system, most, believe it or not, most DC retirement plans don't have a goal. It's remarkable. You know, people say, of course you should have a goal. I know there's some people that might be here from CPF, but I don't want to put anybody in the hook. Does CPF put out a goal? Well, I, maybe I shouldn't. Uh, there's something to think about. Target day funds, life cycle funds. I only mention that because in the United States, and to some degree now in the UK, they're very popular as the thing for people to do that, you know, who don't have advisors and don't want to think about things, all right? They, if you read their prospectus, never tell you what they're trying to achieve. There are no goals in target day funds. So that's a pretty good class. The only point I'm making to you is, an awful lot of investment stuff is not gold. Some things sound like a goal, like you must have heard some of you are engaged in this area. We want to try to earn CPI plus 3%. That's not a goal. That's either a wish. My wish, by the way, is I like riskless 12% inflation protect. Of course, the market won't give it to me, but I could always wish. Or it's a statement of market conditions. We can, with, that, with appropriate risk, you know, acceptable risk, earn CPI plus three. But CPI plus three is not a goal. I mean, I can always get it for you if you don't care how much risk you take, because at some point on the risk return frontier that has an expected return of CPI plus three, that would be trivial. So presumably it's a risk constraint. Well, you know, the world gives you what it gives you. It gives you the interest rates it gives you. You can't, you can't dictate that. So many don't have a what goal, but if they do, they all are measuring it in terms of wealth distribution. Occasionally you'll see some give you an income distribution, you say, oh no, that's an income distribution. Look at the fine print. You know what you'll see in the fine print? We are assuming the interest rate when you retire is 4%, and we'll assume you're gonna live 17.6 years. Well, it's trivial, right? We have an annuity formula. If I know how long you want the payments, and I know what the risk-free interest rate's going to be, there's trivial one-to-one -one correspondence between wealth and income. But it's those two ifs that I want to show you are not good assumptions. So I would submit to you almost exclusively, if there are any goals, it's wealth distribution. How do they measure risk? Volatility to portfolio value, not volatility of the permanent income. Okay? Over here, we're doing that. Success measure is just the size of the account balance. Here is the probability of meeting the goal. This is goals-based investing. By the way, as an aside from the lecture, I make a prediction, which means, of course, it can be wrong, that you will see as one of the waves of investing, real-world practical investing in the future, is going to be goals-based investing. You'll see why in a little while, but let me move on. Asset allocation strategy is either generic, fixed, in Australia, the favorite is 70-30. 70 in equities, 30 in fixed income, that's it. Um, or you have in these life cycle funds, for five years it's 70-30, the next five years it's 65-35, some mechanical glide path rule, that's there. Here, it's tailored, focused on proving the chances of meeting a goal. And that has a profound effect on the outcomes and the distribution. Very, very different, as a quote. All right. Now, let's deal with wealth and income goals. The fastest way I know to show you why they aren't the same or approximately the same is I've done the following. Think of a hypothetical 45-year-old, you see why it's hypothetical, who somehow magically have enough money to fund their whole goal retirement way early. 
What is the risk-free asset for that person who has that goal, if they have enough money to fund their income? What's the safest thing? It would be a financial security, let's say they're going to retire at 65, that pays nothing for 20 years, and at the end of 20 years starts paying an equal amount every month or every year, adjusted for inflation. And it's risk-free. So you're not, have, you know, there's no ambiguity about how much risk. Expected value doesn't count. So it's risk-free stream of payment. Everybody agree with that, right? That's exactly their goal. All right, what I did, in the US we have things called TIPS. They're US Treasury Full Faith and Credit. They're adjusted for inflation. We put together a portfolio of these, which we managed to try to have the same duration, that's a jargon term, as that risk-free asset, to try to match it's as if you could buy that asset, because you can't buy that asset at a decent price. We use a technology which is fairly modern finance, meaning we've only been doing it for about 30 years, but it's market proven. This is what a good, well-run insurance company would do if they wanted to issue a deferred annuity as a liability, and their board said, take no more risk, what would they do on their balance sheet? That is sometimes called immunization. They would run a portfolio that as much as possible exactly matched the liability. So that's what we've done here with real world data, real world securities. And then I did is from 2003, I stopped in 2012 with this chart, doesn't matter. We ran a portfolio where we recorded the monthly returns on that security. Now remember, these are full faith and credit, US dollar denominated. I will take that as risk-free. They're going to get paid. So what's true about the income of this portfolio? No variation at all, right? None. That's why it's risk-free. It's locked in. This is the monthly returns. Could you imagine saying to someone, like one of your colleagues who you did this for, this is your risk-free asset. Does that look to you risk-free? That's as, almost as volatile as the stock market. So if you looked at the value, why? Because interest rates do change. And particularly in very long duration, very long maturity real instruments where the rates are absolutely low, small changes in interest rates cause the value to change a lot. So when you look at the usual way people do the risk returns, this looks like an incredibly risky security. But looked at in terms of what's relevant for this goal, Remember, it has no risk at all because we constructed it that way. The income's locked in, it's done. Those are not close. As an aside, part of this is those who are writing regulations and rules with all good intentions are now in many places saying because these DC plans are core, we ought to put some minimum in to protect protect them. Almost exclusively, the minimum they put in is a wealth minimum or a return minimum, same thing. You know, if you guarantee me 4% and you start with $1,000, you're guaranteeing me a level of wealth at different dates. I believe your bonds in your CPF plan will give that kind of guarantee, but if I'm wrong, Somewhere that is the case, okay? What if you impose that? Ironically, for this hypothetical person that you've all shook your head, I put them in the risk-free asset, the safest thing they could have. I couldn't do that because I can't guarantee that the value might not fall below what they originally invested or any other thing you set. And if that's a rule, I can't do what's the best for this person. And the reason is, you've set a minimum. If you set a minimum income with an income goal, then it does what you think it does. But if you set a minimum value and it's an income goal, that's an example, just one example, of how things get messed up when you use the wrong units of measure. Okay, maybe let me show you a quick another one. The next one is, this is US Treasury bills, the gold standard in dollars for protecting a principal value. You can see in real terms, very low returns, never negative, never falls below. That's what you would expect, right? 
What happens when you measure it in income units? In other words, instead of measuring it in dollars, measure it in units of something that pays a dollar a year starting in 20 years for, let's say, another 20. You understand what I mean by an income unit? It's like a different currency. That is very risky in income. It's very risky. I used to have to give more examples, but given those who have gone through the finish, you know, what's happened in, at least in the United States, but many other places, you know, if you had a million dollars, which is a lot of money, and you're very simple, you put it in bank CDs or something, seven or eight years ago, you could get four or five percent, right? It's 40, 50,000 a year. What can you get today or last year? I'll use last year because we know where the numbers are. We know, the thing, okay? Ten basis points, if you're lucky, in a CD. Okay, depends on the maturity. So, usually getting 40 or 50,000 a year, now they're getting 1,000 or 1,500 if they're lucky. Does that, can you imagine somebody who's actually living on income? And you say, but I was getting 40 or 50. I say, I preserved your capital. It's absolutely still worth a million dollars. It's just that you're getting $1,500 a year. You can't live on it. And you say, some people say, oh, this is temporary. Rates will come up, and then you'll be fine. So maybe they should spend from it until. Last year in the United States, the 30-year U.S. Treasury tips traded at 38 basis points. And this is not a market for taxi drivers and ribbon clerks. This is not irrational exuberance. Right? Institutions, like many of you have here in Singapore, chose to buy those bonds and put money out at 38 basis points, inflation protected, for 30 years. I think it's a bit cheeky, as I guess maybe as a term the Brits used to use, for you to say as an advisor, don't worry, rates will come back up. That may be a speculation, but it is a speculation. It may be a good speculation. But it's not something you can say, don't worry, your rates will come back. Because if you knew that with that degree of assurance, nobody on the planet that's institutional would buy those 30-year bonds at 38 basis points knowing it's coming back. So it isn't a matter of it's a good bet. It's a bet. And once you're talking about bets, you're in a different world. So that's what I want to show you. And this carries over to all investing. And again, despite that, I'm going to skip this. All right, let me come to the integration issue, OK? Integration, I said use all the instruments. By the way, anybody who's feeling warm with all this lights, stop bothering me. I, you know, uh, there's a limit, of course, but that you'll, you know the standards here in Singapore. But if you want to take your jackets off, don't think, oh, I would think you're being uh, disrespectful. Um, all right, so here we, what we're saying here is you want to use all the assets, not all their assets, but all the assets dedicated to retirement. And let me give you an example, and particularly the most important one, typically, is future contributions. So let me give you an example why that's important. Suppose in August of 2008, you had two people. Both of them had the same asset allocation, 100% in stocks. I'm not saying that's optimal, it just makes the math easier for me. You know, I'm up here without a calculator. So you understand? They both have the same asset allocation, August 2008, in the world stock markets. What happened to them by March of 2009? They were down between 30 and 40 percent. Right? Pretty bad. Now let me tell you the rest of the story. If we look at the total of assets, what I have here is, you know, you can think the CPF, the DC together. But the one I want you to see is we're putting in here future contributions. So let's simplify it. CPF, future contributions. Just two assets. When we add them up, that's the real assets that are available for retirement. Suppose the first one, when you add it up, their CPF accumulation at this point is 10% of the whole number. Do you understand? You have two assets, they sum up to, let's say, 100. But only 10 is in CPF. So if CPF were all stocks, which of course it's not, I'm just trying to use that as a way to think about it, how much are they down? 10% or 40%, 4%. Not good, but not a disaster. The second person had 90% of their total assets of 100 
in the CPF in their stocks. They lost 40% on 90, that's 36%. That's more than a third of all the retirement assets. That's a huge disaster. The purpose of that example is to say, if you don't take account of the other assets, you just look at the assets in the particular fund, whether it's CPF or anything else, how can you possibly make an intelligent decision about a good asset allocation without taking account of the other retirement assets? That's the punchline. To, so you need to do that as first order. All right. Now, typically, the first person is probably a younger person. They haven't had much time to put it in, and they have a lot of future contributions to go. So that would be a younger person. The second one's an older person. So there's a correlation with age. But what I want you to say, it's not age that's causing this difference. It's the difference of the composition of the assets they have, both in amounts and in risk. That's really the driver, not age. Age is a bad surrogate in some cases. Now, let me show you the results of goals-based investing as best I can. If we were to take a typical strategy, 70-30, target date funds, just these mechanical rules, and we ask what's the probability distribution at retirement of how much you'll have, it looks like this. Now, it doesn't have to be bell-shaped. You want log normal with skew, it doesn't matter. The main thing is it's just a full range distribution, okay? That's what I would call the typical retirement portfolio in DC. By the way, target day funds in the US, if you take the largest one and average their days, at retirement, they have it on average at least 50% in equities. So there's no idea that they bring the risk way, way, way down. They bring it down, but they don't bring it down. So that's normal, the traditional. What does this solution do? Well, we know we have a conservative that we won't go below. So there are no points to the left here. That's built in. Here's where we're trying to get. We don't want any points to the right of that. Why not? Because our objective is to maximize the chances of getting to the goal. Any points to the right don't add to that. Do you understand? If I get you to the goal, then getting you to the goal or more doesn't get any credit. You know, just think of it. You're doing an optimization problem. If I get you your goal, you're done. So the outcomes for this, by the way, the conservative could be very low. So I'm not saying it always has to be tight. It has to be between there. And actually, and this is the only time I was going to write on the board, and I'm not sure I even need to. There's a distribution here, but it's highly skewed on this if we're doing our job. It looks like that. But the key point is there's nothing to the right. Okay? So there's nothing to the left of the conservative, but there's nothing to the right. And it's, you would expect, we're, you know, since we're optimizing, it's not random where we are in the middle. You're not just as likely to be anywhere. We're trying to get you to the goal. If we're doing a decent job, you're gonna, a lot of people will get to the goal. So the distribution in between, I don't even want to put up there. I don't want to confuse you. you know, I mean, I don't want to give one other thing to think about. Does everybody get that point? Now, how would this traditional one answer the question, what's the chances of getting the goal? They would add up the area under the curve to the left, and they, let's say it's 0.71, 71%. They say your chance of getting the goal is 71% or more. So you have a 71% chance of getting the goal or more. You see, the regular one gives you or more. How many people like or more? Oh, see me after the talk, those who don't put your hand up. I'll take your or mores. <laughs> I'll even give you a couple of shiny sing dollars for it. I think all of us like or more. If what? If it's free. What well, I'm about to show you isn't free at all. In fact, you can do the calculation, not me. I'll show you how. Once it costs something for or more, like everything else, you want to know how much more and what is or more mean. How much more? <laughs> it's when it's free, it's fine. So retirement plus a boat for free is better than just retirement. But retirement plus a boat where you have to pay for it, that's now a discussion. OK? So there's the amour. How would you figure out the value of an amour? Are there any students of finance here? Meaning they took a course in finance? You knew I was going to bring this in somehow. <laughs> Guess where I'm going? Option pricing. What is the value of this? I can tell you exactly. It's the value of a call option 
on this portfolio, 70-30 or a target date fund, doesn't matter. It's the value of a call option on this portfolio with an exercise price at that point, the target, expiration date equal to the retirement date. If you don't know what a call option is, okay, don't worry about it. Just fill in the blank. Imagine there is something there. Now, you can go to the internet, type in Black-Scholes option pricing formula. Down, somebody will offer you a, a calculator for free so you don't pay for it. You know the inputs, you know, everything you have, treasury, you know, you know it's interest rate. The only input you're not sure of is what the volatility of that, and that you can get pretty easily. Do it. Don't listen to me. Think, look at somebody who's going to retire in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. You have any idea what a 10 or 20 or 30 year payout protected call option is worth on a risky portfolio? A boatload. I mean, three year one would be big. Just look at leaps. But don't, tr don't take my word. Download the formula and put it in for any kind of volatility of any meaningful amount and you will get a big number. So that's telling you the value of the or more. Let's say, just to help you understand, if the, if the whole thing is 100, 25% of it being the or more would not be unreasonable if they have 10, 20 years easily. But certainly 10 or 20 years. So a 45-year-old or even a 55-year-old or 50-year-old depends where you retire. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just trying to give you order magnitude. Now, let me give you the intuition as why it matters. This is what would you get with a generic amount. Now let's say we have two providers of retirements. One is the traditional one, and the other one follows this design that I've given you. Well, we know we're going to optimize the strategy in such a way we'll never get the or more. So let's say we start with the same number of dollars, and we start with the same risky portfolio. So both of us have, in technical terms, the same sharp ratio. Neither of us is a better investor than the other in terms of risk return. So we're tied. Now let me show you why, by focusing on the goal, the focus on the goal is going to give a much higher degree of success. And the intuition is very simply, because 25% of the 100 is being used that doesn't help the goal, it's as if they're investing 75 on your behalf. And I'm just trying to give you intuition. Whereas the other person who's following the goal-focused strategy has got 100. There is no real-world investors, certainly for large scale for lots of people on a regular basis, who are going to win a match where one body starts with 100 and the other starts with 75, and they have roughly the same risky portfolios underneath, the same sharp ratios. So what this is telling you is focusing on the goal can improve the chances of getting to the goal. Is it free? Is it magic? Absolutely not. Because you get a better chance of getting to the goal, but you give up getting or more. You don't get the boat. So it's not magic, but it's an example of by focusing on something, the goal specifically for that person, and the goal in hand is retirement, not some other investment objective. If you focus on that, then in terms of that goal, you can improve significantly, materially, first order, the chances of getting there without having more smarts, bigger power, secret sauce. That's what I want you to see. And if you take some of the, what I've shown you away today, and I know we're running you a long time on this. Yes, I have to quit. I'm sorry. But what I wanted to say to you is that by focusing on that, we can improve the efficiency for the same resources of getting people to what's important, a good retirement, which is the whole objective here. This isn't all financial planning. One goal, all right? That, that's what, we, what I want you to take. Well, let me just, uh, just say one last thing, and then if we go. Up to this point, everything is done. It can't be a simpler system. The individual doesn't do anything. Doesn't give you any information, doesn't make any decisions, right? Because that's the default. 
And by the way, this was not purposely designed as default because it was designed before defaults were came in, the 206 Act, but it's ideal for a default because it doesn't depend on people doing anything. And it'll get them a good place or as good as you can with the resources. And defaults are important not just for the people who don't make a decision because a whole bunch of people want to make a decision but they don't know what to do. And so they look and see whatever the employer is suggesting is a default and say, well, that must be what the employer thinks is good, and they take it. So defaults are very important in these retirement systems because many people take them. And with all respect, I think it's a better default than a guaranteed rate of return bond. Okay? Unless you can lock in your goal. You have that, but you know, if you contribute enough, sure. But if if, if in order to get to your goal, you have to take some risk, or you're willing to. The key is, though, when you don't need risk anymore, when you make your goal, you take as much risk off the table, which the other ones don't do. And that's why it does better. But if you get people engaged, let's say they become engaged. Remember I told you about the car engine? For a given goal, let's say they look at their, this is the probability of success, looks like a speedometer. 80 is not too bad. Suppose it said 50. It's like a failing grade, okay? So suppose you said to them, your chances of getting the goal are pretty bad, 50%, nearly failing. What could they do to improve their chances to get to that goal? There are only three things you can do to improve. Save more, work longer, or take more risk. There isn't a fourth. Luck, by the way, is not acceptable as a fourth method of investing. Okay? If someone has a fourth one, by the way, I will promise you I'll put your name in lights as having found the fourth way. Pardon? <laughs> Marry a rich person, yes. No, no, that's not, those are all, yeah, that's, that's the luck part. <laughs> I've noticed, by the way, the people who are looking to do that are exactly the people that don't usually get it. But in any case, <laughs> um, but those are the three that they control. If you agree with that, then the only meaningful choice is for the person is, you know, they, they look at their situation. They don't have to understand probability, by the way. The speedometer, they understand going up is good and going down is not. And that's all they need to make the right decisions. That's behavioral. But if we've got a goal and we don't like where we are, we, there's a little slider. You can increase your saving. And, and this is not an advice engine. And this is, you don't call up somebody. You move the slider. And if you push the button twice, you know it's always twice when you order anything on the internet or anything, right? are you sure? But if you push it twice, your next paycheck is smaller by that amount. So this is a real decision, not a game. I mean, you can fool around with it, but when you push the button, it's real. All right? Do you understand this? This is an order. You'll see the speedometer goes up. That's the good news. What's the bad news that makes it meaningful? Your next paycheck's going to be smaller. Can you deal with that? Say they say, no, not this month. <laughs> So then they say, well, how about moving up your age? Well, they'll be right surprised. That they're willing to work a year longer. They'll see things get a lot better. Then they think, carrying those bricks for another year? <sighs> Not me. What's left? Take more risk. How do you do that here? Here's the conservative. You slide it down. So this had a conservative 2,000. If you slide it down to 1,500, Lo and behold, the meter goes up. People understand. They understand that they're not getting this meter going up for free. What they're seeing is, yes, they're getting a higher chance at the cost that they have a greater risk. They don't have to understand more than that, and that's what they see. This is a behavioral phenomenon that actually is the way we convey it. If there's a better way, fine. You get the concept. Those are the only three decisions. This is the whole decision place. There's not a single rate of return up there. There's not a single asset allocation up there. There's not a single historical return up there. There's none of that. It's not needed, and as I try to convince you, it's not done. Well, thank you very much. I wanted to show you this. There are a few other things because I was asked about it. Reverse mortgages and some other things for public policy. A good reverse mortgage, and I understood a well done one. Poor, poor of anything is not good. I believe in all, many of the countries of the world, in fact, a good number of them which have any kind of housing, we're talking about unlocking thing, is going to be the key to a successful uh, retirement for the vast majority of people. And I was here, I spoke 
seven or eight years ago for the government they invited me to come in the silver industry, but then we used, when you introduced your annuities and everybody was upset that they were going to lose their legacy or something, uh, you know, because the annuity took it away. Um, and I talked to her, so I know where it is, and I believe you can with it, explain to people why, both for the retiree for sure, but also for the beneficiary, that using reverse mortgages can make a better allocation jointly for both. So I just wanted to add that as a kind of footnote. I hope if you, you know, the first time I hear a song that I like, if I don't like it, I don't care, I'm listening to it, and she's singing, she's going, nah, 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 nah. I have no idea what she's saying. But if I hear the song 20 times, I get exactly what she's saying. And that spirit, if you didn't get all the lyrics that I've given you, <laughs> I hope you at least got the melody that there's a lot that could be done to improve the efficiency and effectiveness in delivering a good retirement to the vast bulk of populations in all kinds of cross geopolitical borders, all kinds of structures. All of this technology here not only exists, is being used, it's all market proven, nothing is experimental in that sense. And as I try to give you a sense for the improvements in terms of what you can achieve, not by magic, not by having Warren Buffett too, or somebody else in your, in your drawer, okay, is really there. So I believe we do have a way to address the retirement problem that's stable because this is a mark, you know, the, because it's DC, there's no games playing with, you know, valuing the at liabilities and ending up with trillions of dollars of underfunding of reality, okay? We can deliver a good retirement to people. It's not magic, it's doable, it uses all the tools of modern finance that are market proven. And it's really straightforward and simple. And that's what I offer you. Thank you very much and I apologize for running over. Thanks, uh, Professor Merton, for singing such an intriguing melody. Uh, I will have to hear it a few more times, I think, uh, before I have all the words. But the, the question that, that sort of came to my mind before I open it for questions from the floor is, if you move from the one system, the system that, the older system, that to your new system, um, how much time would it take to sort of implement that? Sort of the systems engineer know in me says that if you go from one radical, I mean, make, if you make a radical move from one system to another system, there are going to be ripple effects, there are going to be, uh, uh, yeah, problems. How long would it take to move from one system to another system? All right, that's a very good question. I, I'll answer that in two parts. Uh, I think the first part, just because you know, I get it so often, those of in the academia maybe can get a little smile out of this. Academics are known, right? Ivory Tower, you know, if it isn't perfect, why bother? I have always found when I go on this road that the practitioners are the ones say, but it isn't perfect. It doesn't, you know, and uh, as if that's the reason. So I just want to tell you, if something is better, materially better, that's good enough for me to start. So, okay. so let's not compare to some hypothetical that doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Let's deal with plans that actually are there, the alternatives. In that context, if you're going from a DB world first to DC, the traditional plan is a really big shock. Mm -hmm. They have to make decisions, they have no idea, they, they've been told about income and suddenly now they have to talk about a whole bunch of things. This looks in many ways very much like a DB plan. Notice DB plans don't offer an or more either, right? So really in a sense, this is, it wasn't designed that way. We didn't say take the best of DBDC. We didn't take a horse and a donkey to try to get a mule. But of course, if you did, this optimization was designed from the bottom up. It just said, take people and design it, okay? What you find is that it, people, I believe, except people in the industry, everybody else finds this more intuitive. They understand income. It looks like Social Security. It looks like, you know, all the you know, DB plan payouts. They, don't feel they have to get involved in a whole bunch of decisions they can't have any idea to understand. So from an individual's point of view, from a participant's point of view, I think the, it works pretty well. Uh, better than I think the alternative, certainly DC alternative. Um, that for those employers, either because of responsibility, you know, they're worried about legal responsibility, but or they just want to do the right things for their employees, 
They have more confidence, because this is managed professionally to a goal, whether or not these people do anything. You don't find that in DC systems. You either have an arbitrary rule, like the, you know, put everything in bonds, or put everything 70-30, or if you're age 34, do this, or that. Do you understand? So there's, I would feel more confident if, the, you know, you have to monitor what these people can do what they say, but it's run professionally, it's adjusted to their goals. If they get a raise, personal information, market information, they adjust the portfolios in response. So it's dynamically, doing. so that part I think is better. I think that because it involves less technical information for the individual, it's actually easier as, as a transition. You could in a country that doesn't feel that people have made decisions before. You could implement the first part, remember the part that does, there's no choice and they have no information they provide, where you set the goals based on professionals who say people with these profiles to have a good retirement, here's the targets, you understand? Yep. And then you set that in conjunction with the, you know, the government or the plan sponsor, think of the CPF. You could do as the first phase, no choice. That's like a DB plan, but there's, it varies according to the income and other things. That would be easier to implement as an intermittent stage because you're not getting into the whole advice business and you know people having you just and then you install the whole thing, and then if you reach a time where people are sufficiently comfortable or you are, and you want to give them choice so that they can engage themselves. So if you're a bird watcher or something, you can change your goals. And okay, you just throw a switch and it works. Mm -hmm. So there are intimate ways to do it. You could actually run a DB plan with the same technology at extreme. Okay. okay? okay. But once it's in, uh, the monitoring is done by the plan sponsor with their advisors, consultants, and so forth, where it should be. Sending people prospectuses for them to evaluate things how, where they are. Frankly, it's a waste of, of resource and, and may even create false sense of, uh, of understanding. So mm -hmm. I, I would say, if you evaluated this, as I would, but I, I'd say I'm quite willing to sit at a table with someone who has an alternative to bring in for real people in a real situation where you, as the fiduciary, feel comfortable about what they're getting. Any questions from the room? Hi, um, I'm Kevin, and from SMU, an ac uh, academic. And uh, uh, Professor Merton, it's very interesting that you mentioned that this is like a DC. Uh, this is a DC print. that's like a DB print. I just want to clarify. Uh, I guess uh, you know, to uh, with regard to to uh, this print that you are proposing, that if you have two person, you know, everything else equal, and eventually one live five years longer than the other. And if they go through the same customization that you mentioned, you know, exact same thing. Are you saying that using this proposed plan, both of them will have the same retirement uh, funding? Uh, that's a very. Did everybody hear the question? The question is that you know you have all these characteristics, you run along, and somebody lives five years longer than someone else. Well, I apologize because I focused so much on trying to get what I thought were the big differences to you. I never got to Act Two. If you could see the screen that we have, we have one for Act Two. And when we, first of all, when we set the targets, how much you need, we do it as an annuity, which means we take account of actually buying an annuity, which would guarantee both of them. So if both of them have the same accumulation when they retire, and if they both annuitize, yeah, one live longer, good for them, but both of them would have the same incomes while they're living. And when they go on to the better place where they don't need money, uh, who cares? You know what I mean? So that's, you know, it's what we take account of longevity and how it changes and all that in, in the analysis. When you actually get there, you have a choice. You know, you have mandatory annuitization of some amount. Most places have now adopted that. Fine. But some people may want to annuitize everything. Some people may want more flexibility. Some people may want to buy what they call tail annuities, which is insurance for over age 85. It's just in case you'd live really long. But you don't need that many options at that time to cover most of what people need for their lives. Working spouses, they're gonna work after retirement for a few, all those combinations. It actually is pretty simple. 
But the goals here are set in terms of actual annuity prices, and the portfolios are run with actual inflation protected securities, like I described there. So how long they actually live doesn't affect the analysis. Interesting. I'm going to live longer. Yeah, I mean, okay, I'm a student from SMU. Okay, um, I'm just wondering, with the, with, the, with the loss of the 25%, right, did you, do you find there'll be a lot of institutional frictions because that's, that's 25% goes to fund managers and a lot of other people because of that, of that probability distribution. When you focus on, say, a particular goal, you, you, you're less likely to have that excess surplus, right? So do you see that as being an institutional friction for the system to actually be implemented? Yeah. Um, the question is, are there institutional frictions? There's none that you need. Mm -hmm. This can be run actually quite efficiently. Uh, it, there are no extra fees. I mean, you, know, the, the, you get more services, so there may be some fees for those extra services in the sense if you're getting all these things done. But you could use the same underlying portfolios. That was my point, and you would do better in the sense of the goal. So, and you must also understand, this is not for your total financial life. You know, people in the United States would say to me, it's un-American to say settle for an amount instead of always wanting more. Um, DB plans don't give you more, but that's not, a, if you want more than that, then that's, you have a separate pot for that. We're, this is designed just for one focused purpose, get you a good retirement. The rest of what, you want to save extra money or get, spend it or gamble or, or be sharp investor, that's fine, that, that is irrelevant. The idea here is what you want is one, to check it off the box. Number two I will say to you, because of the group that's here, don't use introspection to think about these products. You're very highly educated, but many of you are in finance, or you wouldn't be here, or you're in, you know, and you like to manage your own money, or you think you do, until you find out maybe there are better ways, all right? But the point being, the vast majority of people hate personal finance. Even if they do it, they don't, you know, it's like going to the dentist without Novocaine. I mean, they really don't want to do it. And furthermore, it's rather arrogant to think that in your spare time, when you feel like it, that you can do so much better than professionals, like yourselves who are professionals, who devote their whole life and presumably chose that profession because good, they're good at it, I don't care what your IQ is. Somebody does it all the time as a profession versus someone that does it as a hobby. You've got to be smoking something to think you're really going to be able on any systematic way. But that's why I wanted to remind all of you, don't think of it in terms of what you'll be, be fun for you. Think of what you're doing if you're designing this for the vast majority of people who really don't want to think about it, don't know what to do, and just would be delighted to know that it's being managed in a very good way and they're being kept up with the reality of the likelihood that they'll get to a good retirement. This is tough love, there's no array around it. The money's fully funded, we're not assuming alphas or that somehow we can make, you know, 10% more than anybody else. All those nice assumptions that with compounding will allow you to solve any problem, okay? But the reality is both from a social and, but as an individual point of view, and I can't understand your mouth. If you want, I'm sorry I've taken time, but just let me just quickly just say, if you go to get a medical exam, which, you know, just periodically. Now, I want my doctor to say, you know, you're in great shape. In fact, I would think you're 10 years younger than you are. That's what I want to hear. But if I've got a medical problem, I don't want my doctor to tell me I'm fine, to make me feel good. I want him to tell me or her tell me. Otherwise, why bother to get the checkup, right? So if I have bad cholesterol, I want my doctor to send me something that says, Mr. Merton, you've got 300 cholesterol. You're not going to worry about retirement. You're not going to get there. <laughs> so, but then what do they tell me? But there's something you can do about it. You can take Lipitor, you know, stat statins. You can change your diet. And you can exercise. Three ways to solve this very serious problem. So they say, you have a serious problem, but you can do things to fix it. Now, my doctor can't force me to, but that's the way I, this works. It says, you saw that meter up there? If it says 50%, it's saying, your chances of getting a good retirement are not good. But there's something you can do about it. You can save more, work longer, 
take more risk, some combination. Okay? Now, if you don't do it, if I don't do anything about the cholesterol, unless you can impose it on people. But that's the way to think of this. It's, I could give you many more, I won't bore you. But this works, this tool works when you get near retirement because it allows families, you know, typically husband and, and wife, to sit down and talk about intelligently what really matters to them rather than risk return frontiers and so forth, which means nothing to them. What do they want? Are we willing to lower our financial goals so we can go bird watching and retire three years early to do it, is an example. That's a decision they ought to make. This tool allows you to answer that question because you move your age, your work years down three, you get hammered on the probability. Then you say, can we give up going out to dinner once a week extra? and save a little more, uh, can we take a little more risk? And finally they say, you know, to get out and do bird watching at age X rather than X plus three, they look at each other and say, that's what we love to do, it's not very expensive. We don't need that much to live on and actually lower the goal. You see, I mean, I'm just trying to give a sense, it's a real decisions, real people kind of decisions rather than this artificial, you know, what return do you want, what is, which nobody, Anyway, I'm sorry to go on about this, but so much in this industry, and I've been in it, is in La La Land. I mean, it's dealing really with real people and what are real decisions for them. And it's time to do that. The technology is there. The need is there. You've heard about the aging. You need a need to get change. When everything's fine and nobody sees a problem, you can't give away $5 for $3. This is a time, as you identified in your opening, where countries around the world, you know, the U.S. is aging, China's aging faster than the U.S. with the cliff edge on the one child, you know, and so forth. Korea, here, yep. I think I will have to stop this uh, discussion, but I would like to thank uh, Professor Merton uh, for three reasons. First of all, uh, for having contributed to the debate we have here at the university about economics of aging, and this is an interesting input. Uh, at least uh, to think about it and to, to, uh, to reflect on it and see uh, how we can refine it and contribute uh, further to it. Secondly, I would like to thank you for the passion with which you uh, delivered the, uh, the lecture. Uh, it's always great for me to see an educator that is not only a researcher, but an a researcher and an educator who is passionate about the ideas and is trying to convince us with all methods possible legal methods, uh, because you were sp talking about a few that would not be legal here in Singapore. Um, and thirdly, I, uh, li I loved the song, uh, I loved the melody. Uh, I may not have everything uh, yet, but I'm going to listen to it again, uh, because uh, I'm getting closer to retirement, so I may have to think about it. Oh, Thank okay. you very much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.